Thank you for coming here with us. And uh, uh, my name is Yi Ha Liu. I'm the current SIOP um, History Committee Chair. And uh, I would like to welcome everyone to the 2023 Living History Series. And uh, this year, uh, we have um, Professor Milton Hako with us. Um, let's give a round of applause to him for being here with us today. It's a great honor to have you here. Um, just a little bit of um, background information for this session. Uh, so the Living History series uh, is basically a series of interviews of influential um, style of individuals in the history of IO psychology. And we conduct this interview every year. Uh, this, I believe, is the fifth in, uh, in, uh, installment of this series. Uh, for all the past interviews, uh, those were all videotaped and uh, uploaded down. Uh, you can find those on the SIOP channel uh, on YouTube. Uh, and uh, I believe that you will, you will also be seeing this session in the near future, um, I believe. And uh, um, this year we have uh, Milt with us. Uh, as uh, perhaps you all know, Milt is a former South president, uh, former South Foundation president, and uh, uh, many, many other more titles as you will see in my later slides. Um, and uh, in, the, in this interview today, uh, we're going to learn from Milt about not only about the early activities of PSYOP, and also we're gonna um you know just take a glimpse of what the future of PSYOP looks like. Uh, so uh, let's get started. Um just to showcase how much uh Mel, you have achieved in your career, uh here is a list of achievement uh or like or the milestones uh, I was able to find in your autobiography uh in your entire career as you know, academic, as a practitioner and as a leader for this community. Um like honestly it's really hard to narrow down. The list into one slide is just because how much you have achieved in your entire career. And uh, if there's anything missing, uh, please let me know. And uh, um, this is not really like a, the first question, but uh, while I was putting this list, uh, I was wondering, you know, like based on your uh, achievement, like, you know, faculty at three different universities, past editor, you know, past owner of PSAC, South president, founding father of APS, type foundation president. Among all those achievements, um, is like what is your proudest achievement among all of them? If if there, if there is any. Good morning, everyone. I uh, hate to start out with the saying it's not on the list, but it really is my family, mm. uh, which has uh, two kinds of dimensions. First, please, please stand up, say goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, two children and the rest of that. The other dimension, of course, is the academic dimension. All of my uh, doctoral advisees, uh, doctoral mentor for many committees and so on. Uh, teaching is like being a god when it's good <laughs> and when it's going well. But it, it is the way that you influence the future. You'll get to that too. All right, thank you. Um, well, so yeah, since you mentioned family, I guess we're gonna start with your early life um, from your childhood. Um, so like I got all those information, you know, from from your uh, autobio, from uh, uh, from Google search, and uh, um, let's you know start early on from your childhood and school life. Um, so based on your autobio, like uh, you were born in. Um, Hutchinson, Minnesota, and spent part, part of your childhood in Browntown, Minnesota, which was the picture, uh, you know, on the left bottom side. And on the right bottom side, I was about to find a picture of the, like, a, that's, you know, that's the small shop your parents owned when they, uh, when they ran and owned, like, a newspaper, local newspaper. Yes. And, shop, and right? Uh, what you don't know, you know, is that it, the gamble store is where I play in the basement with my best friend when I was in first and second grade. Uh -huh. The shop was directly next door to the facility, so we know to see there now. Uh, parents were editors and publishers and deliverers of the Brown Home Bulletin. And uh, what inspired me to pursue a career in I.O. Well, by the time I was in second grade, I figured I could become mayor of that town. <laughs> because I was starting to figure out how the world worked instead of just what happened at the house. Okay, great. Um, and then moving on to, you know, um, high school, you attended Hopkins High School, that's the right up corner. 
uh, where you said your favorite class was sharp, such as woodworking, drafting, metalworking, and electricity, everything but human. Uh, <laughs> uh, you also mentioned that you were not so much into math in high school, which is interesting given your career as an IO psychologist later on. Uh, and uh, you then attended Minnesota for both undergrad as a double major in philosophy and psychology, and eventually pursued a PhD in psychology. Um, that is also when you met with Lee. Uh, you know, you guys married nine days after you deposited your dissertation in 1966. Uh, you know, what a great way to celebrate being done. Correct the record. Okay. We had already been married four years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, got so, my facts wrong. Oh, that's, that's, that's perfectly okay. In fact, we got married when we were juniors. Uh, we timed out for a while uh, to work full time. Uh, we had $14 cash between us when we get, went to Chicago to get married. And uh, believe me, I know about inflation. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I guess like you, 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 um, you talk about that a little bit, but like, you know, um, if, is there anything you want to add about what inspired you to pursue IO psychology, uh, especially, you know, given your interest in shop? Um, <laughs> so shop is all about engineering and how the, how the things work. And I got interested in how the people work because it's really people that make things work. And, and so this complex societies that we now live in, unprecedented in so many ways, but also so remindful of the aftermath of World War II uh, in terms of the, the current crop uh, why is there dictatorship and should we put up with that or how we can deal with it and the rest. Uh, every problem at root is a human problem in some dimension or another. And while it might have engineering aspects of it, technological delivery aspects of it, it, it also depends entirely and immensely on what People around the entire globe decide to do this. So, Martin Dinette was really a big mm -hmm. inspiration because, in his individual difference class, uh, he, he laid out all of those kinds of connections. He had started out in an engineering career, a chemical engineering, he turned out to be. I had some 10 or 12 different undergraduate majors until I took an exam mm -hmm. in one, some last only three weeks. I guess this isn't the one. You, you figure out how the world works and you look for it back to the continuing onslaught. <laughs> That's great. Sometimes it ends up being here. <laughs> um, any questions from the audience? I, I think I saw someone raising the hand. No. All right. Well, something in Yeah, something in Yahoo if you are, uh, if you have anything you want to ask. All right, moving on to your academic career. Uh, here I have, you know, just a few screenshots of a bunch of, you know, some papers uh, that you uh, co-authored with. Um, and, uh, you know, over the past 60 years, uh, you have been a prolific researcher and, uh, you know, constantly published journal articles on the best journals in the field. Um, like here, I have your articles published starting from the 1960s on the top left corner to the 1970s. 1990s, um, 2000, even into the 2010s. Um, and that you are best known for your research on testing, assessment, learning, uh, you know, in both applied settings and educational settings. Um, so like when I was reading through your record, like your articles, you know, I, was, I couldn't stop by wondering, like as a junior academic myself, um, you know, I know how time consuming and exhausting it can be when you know, with the public papers. And uh, sometimes, you know, when I dream about my own retirement, um, publishing is probably not one of the, you know, the, the many things I plan to do. Um, so I guess uh, my question is like, you know, what's your secret recipe um, in terms of managing your 60 plus years of academic career, you know, by always staying curious, passionate about research and everything? Oh, well, I, as you will learn, and probably have already, uh, students teach you an awful lot. Uh, the good thing is that students don't know that it can't be done. Uh, young people don't know that it can't be done. Uh, and that's why we're so dependent on what happens to young people in terms of education. How do they learn? Uh, 
the end of my career, I got very interested in how people learn, not how people are taught, but rather how you figure it out and how you make sense of your world and where it's going. I think we are all everywhere. Explainer, you get explanations that are good enough for me. And you live with those pretty much. A lot of people simply drop out and the old time with it and it becomes good enough for them. Uh, and that can lead to lots of problems that we see from time to time. But there's always more to the story than just the where you've settled. Uh, science is never finished. There is no final best answer. There are just continual and few details. So Looking for the even seek whatever. Uh, and, and so how are we going to get out of these present messages? They are solvable. Uh, they are not. We, we need to approach them and, and keep listening and keep learning rather than simply to say, okay, we got it. <laughs> you know the right answer. That's that. Never. Continual. Okay. Yeah, great. And uh, relatedly, since you mentioned uh, learning from students, like a related question I have here is, you know, like um, cause all those articles here, you know, those included here, those not here, um, um, you have a lot of collaborators and you do mention in your auto bio that, you know, you work with a wide range of people on your research and uh, you really brought up, you know, how uh, how you became friends with many people in this field. And it seems like relationship has been an important integral part of your career. Um, so I guess um, well, we want to listen a little bit, learn a little bit about, you know, how your collaborators, your students, you know, how your friends, how do those people play a role in your career as an IO psychologist? Academics love to be asked. Uh, we love to provide answers. If we get in trouble when we think we have no chance, uh, and again, it, it seems that it's vital to be what of somebody because they see things that I haven't seen. So, they can do the interchange. Uh, with regard to a lot of the English in the United States about racist, uh, the Civil Rights Act 1954 passed while I was in graduate school. And that was hugely controversial at the time. Uh, but Everett Dirksen, the minority leader of the Senate, made a comment that stronger than all the armies is an idea whose time has come. And then he voted for cloture on the Senate floor so that the Senate Civil Rights Act would be debated and then voted. So they closed the debate path, and here we are. Uh, so then, um, George Floyd gets killed in my home city. Uh, and almost never do you get a chance for a do-over to take a look at what have we done, what needs fixing. It is a continual process rather than something that gets finished in once and done forever. Uh, and so it is collaborators and graduate students and newspapers and news articles, um, even echo chambers, depending on which ones you listen to, you need to listen to multiple ones rather than just your own. Uh, a Dunning-Kruger effect is something that came up in a, a meeting a couple of months ago in South Carolina, and, and I'm afraid we are becoming a nation of Dun Dunning-Krugerites. So look it up, the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, experts speaking out of the realm of their authority, but with authority. <laughs> Yeah, great answer. Um, all right. So my next question, um, you know, let's take a look back at your time um, being style president. Um, like, um, first, like a, that was in 1983, 1984, where um, you gave your presidential ad address in Toronto with the theme uh, of where we are, what we are doing in the world. And uh, here is a, um, screenshot from your um, presidential address and uh, um, the fruit like uh, for anyone in the audience if you are interested you can scan the QR code to access the full presidential address um, and also just to promote the history committee a little bit uh, we have amazing history museum gallery over there uh, with that QR code where we have many past presidents autobiography uh, especially for the earlier ones um, like uh, our committee has been working really hard on collecting more from our presidents. Um, so, you know, 
if you are in the room and you haven't submitted your autobiography, make sure you reply our emails when you got one. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, well, back to mail. Uh, you know, uh, since you gave this uh, um, speech on what we are doing in the world, I guess you, know, you want to compare how well we are doing now to you back in the nineteen eighties. Uh, how would you say? Uh, well, compared compared with nineteen eighty four, I think we've made a huge amount of progress. And the main change that I see is that we are much more talking to the world than we were in 1984. We talked primarily to ourselves. Uh, we were two years old as PSYOP at that point, uh, and it was a, a nice change in terms of incorporating. And so all of a sudden, we could have student members. We could control our own funds. We could do a lot of things. It's all been going in very positive directions. Uh, because we know addre now address the world out there as much as we worry about what's the quality internally and, and what's happening internally. Uh, so that's that's really the start for that. Yeah. One of the problems of becoming uh, into your 80s is using nouns that flash in. You want to say something about it. Uh, I'd, I'd like to buy a noun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I have multiple things that I can say about this, but uh, the uh, thing I thought of to say when uh, the how started this, this particular scheme was fleeting again. Uh, <laughs> particularly that, that The, the browser goes on the fritz from time to time. The, the hard drive, the mush soft drive is still intact. Everything's still there. Uh, the point gets lost. It'll come back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, good <laughs> to know. Let, let, let's move on. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, moving, like, now, like, uh, moving on, uh, you were also um, editor for PSYC for almost 10 years, like, uh, more than 10 years between 1973. To 1984. Um, after that, you became the owner and the publisher for PSI um, up until 2004. Uh, like uh, last week, our current editor, Zen Zen, uh, is, he made me aware of this uh, new editorial piece uh, with your reflection of your time uh, as an editor at PSI, uh, along with the reflection of all other you know, um, past editors after you. Um, the QR code is there. Uh, if you want to you know, if you want to scan that, you have to access to the editorial piece. Um, you know, the, for this question, um, I want to ask you, uh, you know, based on your experience um, on editing and the managing P side and uh, in like uh, or broadly, you know, all the top tier journals in our field, you know, what has changed in terms of publishing, in terms of re uh, reviewing, in terms of, you know, what good research, um, things like that. Uh, so when I was a graduate student, the advice passed on to me was, uh, if you're going on an academic career, uh, publish everything you can get your hands on worry about quality after you've achieved tenure. <laughs> and uh, publisher perish uh, really means publish and perish <laughs> because everything perishes eventually, everything changes eventually. Uh, so you get going. In, in the publishing business, it's now very much consolidated. Uh, it was tough getting out of the editorship. Uh, to discover that uh, the page charge that had been in place to keep PSYC out of bankruptcy, uh, go to this QR code and read the whole history. Uh, there are statements by a whole bunch of editors, and I got to lead off. But few people know PSYC of today uh, who have seen only that know that it was very near bankruptcy in 1970. And in 1971, it adopted a page charge, which made it look like it was going to be uh, publishing. Uh, uh, the noun is gone. I'd like to buy a noun. Vanity publishing. Uh, pay for getting it printed. Uh, Anne-Marie Ryan had a wonderful idea uh, when she was facing tenure, and, and that was uh, a phone number you could dial in. We had three JAP articles. One eight hundred results. <laughs> well, P. Psych was in that league as a vanity publisher uh, when I became editor. Uh, then, ten years later, discovered that uh, there was a, a serious amount of cash built up in the back. 
uh, and it's a long struggle there. Don't have to count the entire struggle. Uh, but publishing is much more consolidated these days. And when um, you could buy journal articles uh, instead of entire issues, and now when you can get any article you want right here, uh, the world has really changed substantially. Mm -hmm. I, I'm delighted that PSYCH is as big and as well regarded as it is. Uh, it, it shows that we need to be much more interconnected and you know, one of the songs proper. Oh, great. All right. Uh, another important achievement in your life um, that happens during your time as a faculty member at Bowling Green, uh, like, like one thing you mentioned that you really had fun with was the, was the creation of the Springboard program. Uh, how many Bowling Green alum or current students do we have? Do we have you in the room? How many of you know about this or or part of this? Oh, only no. Okay. Two. Um, yeah. So this um, Springboard program, um, like I have a short introduction here, uh, which is like a one credit hour course where first year students, you know, they participate in to gain like a competitive edge by learning how to be successful in college. Um, and uh, um, since this is like a very fun child of yours um, in, in the, you know, back in the days, I guess I want you to maybe talk a little bit more about this project and how, you know, how higher education has evolved uh, over the years, um, things we need to keep in mind moving forward. Well, when I was recruited to Bowling Green, I, I got the dream job of a lifetime. I was pretty sure that I would never get an endowed chair anywhere, especially when uh, Michigan State uh, picked Dan Ilgen. And, and so that got settled. And, and I didn't have the kind of record that was going to be competitive at such a thing. Uh, but Bowling Green uh, decided to recruit me anyway uh, and took me from the University of Houston. And so all of a sudden I had a, a job with a nice salary, uh, tenure, and no job description, zero job description. I could do whatever I wanted, however I wanted, and, and, and that's completely open field. So that's terrorizing to begin with, but I had seen a lot of things along the way and I tried a number of things. So the first thing we tried was to put together a development center for new graduate students. Uh, that failed within about three years, but the idea was going to be to have uh, uh, senior graduate students be the assessors, actually development coaches. Uh, and I'm looking at Sydney McCauley right now simply because I had been a trustee of the Center for Creative Leadership, went through their programs, got to know Cindy there. Uh, and so we were going to put together something that would provide a lot of feedback to developing graduate students to get their game together. Uh, they didn't want faculty too directly involved because faculty is top management in that kind of an organization. And you don't want to make a mistake in front of the CEOs uh, when you're working in middle and lower levels of the organization. My conclusion was that undergraduates are already ruined by the time they get to graduate school. <laughs> because the kind of drill and kill, spit it out on the test, we'll get it the next morning, uh, that's already so well socialized. So using some ideas from CCL, and then also from Alverno College, which had started by training faculty members and volunteer assessors to be assessors and give feedback to students ubiquitously throughout the entire curriculum um, so I spent 20, 25 years with watching and looking at what happens at Oklahoma College and thought, well, here's my chance to put some of that together. And so it, having concluded that graduate students are already ruined, the drill and guilt, spit it out, write the paper, get your credits, go on, um, uh, decided to create this. It, it ran on a pilot basis and it ran for three or four or five years. I don't remember exactly. But the URL that's there will get you three boxes of artifacts left over from when it was put together. We had coaches from uh, the university, advanced students, staff members. We had the technology uh, uh, assistant from the uh, psych department. We had the chief of police, the uh, 
a proprietor and, and franchisor of a pizza man, and all his coaches would be with students and seriously exercise in going through it. Uh, we really took formative assessment very seriously. Uh, that's not the, the, the score that you got, the summative part of what goes on in assessment, the score of what's your test, what's your grade, and so on, but rather what does it mean and how are you going to do something about it? The big challenge still with anything that is highly quantitative is to figure out what the numbers mean, what do they imply, what do you do differently, the kind of stuff coming from the military, especially as an after action review, uh, is a good mental model for how to proceed. And so we put this together. As I said, it ran for several years. Then we ran into a budget crisis. And, and of course, things got wiped out despite the kind of 5% retention and progress through curriculum uh, that was higher. Uh, so it, it still resides in these boxes. I'm sure it will happen sooner or later as we get over stupid ideas like no child left behind and testing absolutely every student and then hauling teachers uh, up in front of courts because their students aren't gaining enough on measures that really don't reflect enough gain. Uh, so uh, there, there's still an awful lot to be done in public education, education of any kind, especially in thinking about it as learning. So uh, graduate work has got lots of hands-on things, development, mostly going in different directions. Okay. Great. Uh, the next question um, is about you know your more recent years of serving as the SIA for SIA Foundation and the, as a SIA Foundation president, uh, uh, which you know by reading your um, auto bio, uh, you have been you know uh, pretty much uh, involved in serving for the SIA administrative office since like 1996. Right. And uh, in the more recent years, I've been on the board of trustee for the foundation and uh, as a president for the foundation from 2009 to 2022. Um, and uh, during this time, you have been working really hard to enlarge the foundation's endowments, legacies and gifts uh, to support grant scholarships and awards. Um, so, um, you know, um, I guess the question is, you know, compared to your time as the style president, uh, you know, in the 1980s compared that time. Um, to your service for the um, uh, for the society around more recent times, you know what kind of new opportunities and challenges we are facing, or you know what different how things are different um, compared back then to today's day. I, I think you uh, hit a key element in an earlier question about uh, simply how do you stay fresh. Uh, we we tend to think that when you finish the project, it's over and done, and now on to the next one and so on. Uh, and, and partly that's true, but there are always things that can be improved. I've been talking with Paul Green uh, about his work on training interviewers and so on. And what he's working on now, uh, this happened just last night. I'm very excited for him and for the entire field for people to keep taking a look at what happened and now what does what happened mean going forward. And, and where should we go? And so uh, I, I know that uh, there are lots of things that should preoccupy us. I am delighted that that uh, IO psychology is so strong and engaged with the world now, uh, looking at the kinds of problems that are out there and about uh, in the headlines every day in terms of how we live in communities and what work means, uh, there are lots of things uh, that we have gotten starts on. There are hints in the literature about what would be better and so on. Uh, but I think we really need to think about not just uh, good practice and, and best practice, uh, but even better practice uh, going beyond that. I, I think we need a, a fourth level of superlatives. So good, better, best is the, the usual trio. Uh, but then there is whatever comes along next. It, this, this trio doesn't have a, it, it's a slice in time. It, it, it doesn't have a fourth dimension of time itself. And, and so uh, I've been thinking, Andy Amato is one of my doctorate students at Ohio State. Um, he's from Hawaii, 
Uh, he had a lot of fun adapting to central Ohio, having grown up in Maui, uh, and then being an undergraduate at the University of San Francisco. Uh, but in any case, uh, he's been a friend ever since, and I think, keep thinking of Hawaiian pigeon as Mo better <laughs> would be, start to add that time dimension. What we need is something like that, more best, uh, because even something like Springboard that we just talked about as a way of changing and reforming undergraduate uh, education, uh, that kind of thing is needed. Uh, so that students have a lot more deep knowledge about where they're going, but then also reflective and, and, and build upon it uh, in series. So uh, I, I think you can take just about any dimension of your life and look at it and, and then figure out what are some challenges here? Uh, look for this, for things that are, are dealable with uh, in the present resources in the present time and make incremental changes. Uh, grand revolutions usually end up in, in big messes uh, and uh, huge projects. Uh, one of the books I'm reading currently is called Gradual. Uh, it is a, a, a written by Greg Berman and Aubrey Fox uh, who talk about the virtue of incrementalism uh, and pointing out that that's how Social Security got to be such a, a wonderful program, uh, not the total revolution, but rather something that has been amended 90 times by the federal government over its life sign. But incrementally, it is a much more important resource, even though it is such a tiny fraction of what people need in retirement. And there are still lots of problems out there, the, the kind of incrementally for um, approach, I think, is one that will make a big difference for people. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, I guess, like, on, on a similar note, I think it's a, it's, good, it's a great time for us to talk about the IO praxis, uh, which you have been a huge advocate for uh, in the recent years. Uh, like, the idea of IO praxis means that, like, the synergy, the synthesis of theory and practice uh, without assuming the privacy of either. Um, and uh, in your autobio, you discuss how this idea is slightly different from what we know about the, you know, practice, science, scientist practitioner model for IO psychology. Um, and the visually, that's the symbol of the IO practice. And, uh, um, could you like, you know, explain to us, you know, what this means and uh, how this is different from the scientist practitioner model and uh, what we should do to embrace um, the IO practice? Uh, so, scientist practitioner is what we all are, and that's, uh, I think, why we are so important, why we have been able to engage the world, why we keep getting asked to be involved in projects, problems in the world. Problems are solvable. Uh, none of them are insoluble entirely, uh, perhaps with the exception of death, but even there, uh, the human productive lifetime has doubled over my lifetime. Uh, and uh, so uh, how, how does this how does this work? I've, I've been really impressed with the Boulder Conference in 1954 uh, and the idea of a scientist practitioner. Uh, but I've always thought, well, scientist practitioner, as soon as you've said all of those syllables, the person you're talking with, eyes are glazed over. And Wayne, uh, I am really pleased that you put together the Scientist Practitioner Award because that's really what we are and that's really what we do. Uh, and I have a synonym to introduce, which I've been trying to introduce for decades. It's up there, Praxis. It's from the ancient Greek. Uh, there are three kinds of knowledge that Aristotle outlined, uh, and praxis is the action of one of them. There is theory, there is production, and then there is action. And so the, the uh, praxis statue that is now awarded to the distinguished award winners at the opening plenaries uh, represents all of those with the double helix, but also the clear crystal surround of 
so it, it is that we, we, we solve problems for employers, for individuals. Uh, we practice in terms of individuals and organizations, especially embedded in organizations. Uh, and so uh, praxis is a, a, a word that can fit in that elevator speech if we decide to take on uh, the process of getting a word adapted to our use in terms of describing what it is that we do. Uh, so I have uh, up here, when you're leaving, please pick up one of these cards because it's praxis uh, definition on, on the back side uh, showing that model. And then it talks about individual and organizational praxis. Uh, once upon a time, this outfit was called the Division of Business Psychology, uh, and it has a long history of names. Uh, discussion a month and a half ago uh, came off the idea of, well, maybe we should change the name. Uh, we, we should swap the name from industrial and organizational psychology to work and organizational psychology. Uh, then Lietta Hugh commented that she's always thought the, that the I in SIOP stood for individual rather than industrial. And, and so a, a kind of near-term way of dealing with this would be just to suggest that the field ought to be named uh, the Society for Individual and Organizational Psychology. That would be a, an easy, relatively small change. But it is knowing about individuals and what individual differences and how are people put together and how do people function, but especially in organizations. And so not just profit making jobs, stand up and do jobs and so on, uh, but volunteer work, uh, all the kinds of things that are involved in effort in networks and so on. So I think Praxis does a nice job of describing that and uh, whether it takes off or not. We'll see. Uh, it might, it might not. You see, you've seen a, um, the hashtag mm -hmm. and, and many of these. And so, uh, there's also a hashtag on this. Uh, as you send photos to friends and so on, use the IO Praxis hashtag. It turns out to be a hashtag that didn't exist before about two weeks ago. <laughs> Um, we'll see. Yeah, it might go viral. Uh, well, you can make it viral. Yeah, we can definitely. Make it <laughs> I <viral>. can't. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I hope all those questions cover the you know most important achievements and milestones in your you know in your career. And uh, at, like uh, to summarize your career, like uh, put this up from your auto bio. Um, you know about your members and uh, what do the members mean. I guess I'll just give the audience a few seconds to read this very nice summary of your career. And there's the hashtag. Um, yep. And uh, like, uh, um, and also like while reading this, I was very intrigued by the two bumper stickers there, you know, go where there's trouble and keep your sense of humor. Uh, we are sort of running out of time, but like, uh, could you give us a quick, you know, a quick overview on what, like, uh, what do you mean by Go where there's trouble and uh, keep your sense of humor there. Uh, so go where there's trouble is is a mantra of mine. If you're looking for problems to solve, find one that interests you and and then go there. Uh, this comes from an autobiography of Murray Lincoln, the founder of the Nationwide Insurance Company. Uh, it started as the Ohio Farm Bureau Insurance Company, uh, automotive and so on. Uh, but he was told the story by a Yankee farmer when he was a teenager. Uh, he was looking for advice about a career, and the farmer said, go where there's trouble. You can have an impact on how it's resolved. What your views, what you say, how you handle that uh, can have an impact. Uh, so over on the side is, is a list of where there is trouble, such as flat wages. One of the things we studied and abandoned since 1980 or maybe even 1970, uh, compensation. Uh, there were many JAP articles about comp, but we've not really addressed that very seriously. It's horrible. The workforce is aging, migration is another mass incarceration, <laughs> terrible problem. Uh, tribalism, ethnicism, nationalism, you hear that every day, every channel. 
climate change, genetic engineering, fake news and broken trust. Uh, there are plenty of problems out there. So there's, there's a good list of where the needed for IO praxis about individuals in organizations, in echo chambers or wherever, attitude uh, change and the rest. Uh, so that's one bump is for that. That's one of the things I've used to sort out what I choose to look at. Uh, so yeah, keep your sense of humor while you're doing that because you can really go nuts. I get stressed easily enough. Many people get stressed easily enough. My weak point is when I have lost my sense of humor and am now in people's face and furious and the rest. And so here is something from Martin Gardner. This is the Laffer curve. You recognize the theory that is government revenue at the zero point. There, uh, if the tax rate is zero, then there is no government revenue. If the tax rate is 100%, then there is, of course, again, uh, no government revenue because everything is maximum government, government revenue. Martin Gardner wrote the mathematical games column for Scientific American for several decades. So on to the next one. Now, this is a clearly better model of the real world. <laughs> At the extremes, it agrees with exactly what Laffer theorized, uh, but at any point along the, the, the vertical that's to the right in, in this, you can cut through and, and you see what the government revenue is at that point. Virtually everything is multiply determined. Uh, there are lots of causes. The book Gradual is very nice explication of why incrementalism is superior so approach to that. So don't think you're going to completely reform the world or set things in, in, in perfect direction. Uh, perfect is the enemy of good enough or getting by for right now. Uh, Civil Rights Act of 64 was a wonderful advancement. We ain't done yet. Uh, and so let's keep on going. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so like we have five minutes to um, to ask a few questions from the audience. Like I have a few here on my uh, on my app. Uh, the first question was, have you ever felt burdened by the need to make a meaningful impact on the world? Um, do, you have a, do you have any advice on how to not let that pressure ruin the enjoyment of the journey of life? Uh, again, keep your sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite Peanuts cartoons was Charlie Brown, uh, Linus, uh, about uh, its future. Uh, and uh, particularly that I need a word. I potential is a heavy burden. And, and that can be dealt with. Oh, great. Uh, the next question is, um, other values can drive the choices we make in life. Uh, would you share the core values you relied on in your career and in your life? Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. That's great. All, all of the above. And, and, and one, of, one of the silly things we do is ask forced choice questions, such as in the implicit attitude, uh, attitude technology. It's forced choice. As though there were only these polar, polar opposites uh, we need to think more about the multiplicity of causation and context because that's where the solutions are. It's not just in, is this good or bad, or active or passive, or weak or strong, to use Osgood's uh, semantic differential dimensions from the beginning. Great. Uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah. Wayne. Uh, I don't want to hear it. At 3M Corporation. Yeah. And you don't know you And I'd love to know from your perspective, how do you influence me and your interpretation of the science? Um, so the first course I had with Marv was uh, Psychology 126, Individual Differences Methodology. 
Uh, and he was not a, a, a sterling lecturer, but he clearly knew everything he was talking about. He knew it at a level of depth that was very impressive, even at the University of Minnesota faculty. And as you listen to him, you, you get to say, this, this is coming to me straight. The, the illustration I love is about why reliability matters in terms of test, retest, and, and so on. And it was with rocket launches because the space program was getting organized at that point. We were going to go to the moon. Uh, and so if you take the cumulative reliability of all of the parts of Saturn V, all of a sudden you've got failures and explosions on but young engineers don't know it can't be done, so they do it. So Elon Musk is a fabulous engineer. He doesn't know everything, but he's got some good ideas about things that need to be done and, and cracking out of the usual patterns we sub into. So I have absolutely, and that's what we all do it in all of our own ways. And that's why I keep coming back to PSYOP as my intellectual and social and emotional home uh, instead of other places. I, I'm a, a fellow of AAAS. Uh, there are very few in applied scientists of any kind that are AAAS fellows, but there are some. Uh, and, and I'm very proud of that, but it is all of what we do that's important instead of Sticking out on that dimension necessarily. Thank you. Uh, any, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark. This is my first conference, so very happy to be here. Welcome. Were there any pivotal moments in history or in your personal life that you have to or you changed your career? Uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated at one point, and so Lee and I took our two children to North Minneapolis on a march. All three of their grandparents opposed us getting involved, and we knew we needed to be there. A little bit later, we were involved heavily with prison reform work in Ohio, in part because the governor of the state dropped some dynamite, ordered that dynamite be dropped in on hostages in the Ohio penitentiary. I thought as a state employee, that's not a good way to start a state career. Uh, and, and so there are plenty of problems to be solved. And uh, so think about the events that impact you. And again, go where there's trouble and, and keep your sense of humor. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to thank you. Yeah, I think that. Well, thank you all for turning up and, and please pick up some of these cards and I look forward to seeing you in the halls and, and so on. Yes, this. thank and, you. And carry on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. And uh, the QR codes are here if you want to learn more about Mel's history. Uh, feel free to use those QR codes.